Meanwhile, Yates continued corresponding with the Matherses, seeking from them the skillful and systematic help he could not get from either Maud or Russell. On 25th April 1898, he wrote to Lady Gregory from Paris, where he was visiting the Matherses and was buried in Celtic myth. <clears throat> he said that he was expecting visits from Maud and Fiona MacLeod. But a card from Sharp, who was Fiona MacLeod, on 30th April, reported that Fiona had suffered a breakdown in health and could not be coming as planned. <laughs> and George Russell... <coughs> Sorry, Sharp um, actually perceived his pseudonym as a different being within himself. So she was sick, but he wasn't. <coughs> the great Celtic gathering to which Yeats looked forward to failed to occur. Yeats did not receive did receive help from Fiona MacLeod in the form of inspiration in the summer of 1898. He mostly took, of course, a lot of ideas from her novels even before he met the actual uh, Sharp. And it, oh no, Yeats didn't know MacLeod was Sharp at that time. That's right. He thought Sharp and Fiona MacLeod were two different people. Yeah, because Sharp, but he suspected, I believe. Anyway, in the form of inspiration in the summer of 1898 when Her Green Fire was published. So yeah, taking a lot from her books. Yeats was taken with it and wrote to tell her so after June. Wow, so he's writing this person not knowing it's this other person who he's friends with. That's quite, that's quite it'd be hard to get away with that these days with uh, our technology. Yeats was taken with it and wrote to tell her so after June. He particularly liked the herdsman. When Yeats returned to writing the rituals of, for the Celtic mysteries, the herdsman was to supply the title of one of the four main officers or initiators of the Celtic rites. It was really like a sort of a kind of strange spiritual catfishing Sharp was doing as Fiona MacLeod. <laughs> Yeats was being Victorian catfished. Towards the end of 1898, Yeats was in Sligo, seeking help with the Celtic Order from his uncle George Plexfin. Yeats recorded notes to their visions on 13, 14, 27, 31 December 1898, 5th, 6th January, and 8th February 1899. Primarily, the visions undertook to explore through Plexfin's clairvoyance the four sacred cities of the Tua, the tribes, the quaternity, quaternity on which all the rites were based. They were trying to explore the symbolic correspondences with each of the four talismans of the Tua. Most people pronounce that Tuatha, just uh, in case you're wondering what word I'm saying, as they related to the suits of the tarot, compass points, elements, druids, birds, animals, gates, and so on. They no doubt hoped that by filling the initiatory rite of each grade with all the correct corresponding symbols, that a corresponding force such as that of imagination in the case of the fourth grade would be awakened in the candidate. It's very interesting, actually. These visions, which seemingly did not excite as much as the first series, although he did write of them in his autobiography, <clears throat> which is the title of a book by Yates, took place over a period of about two and a half months. <clears throat> the last date, recorded 8 February, presents a problem, however, if Wade's dating of one of Yeats's letters is correct, Yeats was in Paris on 4th February visiting Maud. It was a most depressing visit, as Yeats wrote to Lady Gregory, because, quote, she had been almost cold with me, though she has made it easy for me to see her. Five days later, Yeats had occasion to be even more depressed, for Maud had decided, Yeats wrote to Lady Gregory, to return to Ireland to work with the evicted tenants, thereby finally abandoning the Celtic religion for politics. Couldn't see that coming, could you? Uh, Maud gone mad. Maud lost interest in the Celtic mysteries, and although Yeats did not wholly abandon them at this point, his interest too appears to have waned at this time. What could have caused that? He was becoming increasingly involved in theatre business, and most of March, April, and part of May 1899 were taken up with the controversy over the Countess Kathleen, one of his plays that was no doubt staged at the Abbey Theatre. Furthermore, troubles were brewing in the London Temple, <clears throat> Crowley, where Mather's autocratic rule in absentia was creating ill will and talk of expulsion of Mather's as chief. A letter to Yeats 
from Moyne on 29th May 1899, apologizing for the Mathers' inattention to Celtic matters was probably their last correspondence for many years. Yeats was, after all, soon to become leader of the Isis Urania rebels, about to cast out their chief and occult teacher. That doesn't sound familiar at all. Yeats spent, by his own reckoning, ten years in a vain attempt to find philosophy and to create ritual for the order of Celtic mysteries. Virginia Moore wondered if by vain Yeats meant untrue, unworthy, spiritually impotent, or vain in the sense that the castle of heroes remained, as Maud said, a castle in the air. Of course, they were far from untrue, unworthy, spiritually impotent, although the order suffered from external pressures which were to show Yeats that, as a group, his collaborators simply were not spiritually prepared to undertake a serious effort to institutionalize the Celtic mysteries. Though, when I think about the tarot reading elsewhere in his writings that shows how the Celtic mysteries would fare that year, it's interesting because the Yod position Yod position was um, five of wands. The hay position was the devil. The vav position was temperance, and the if I remember, the, the hay final position was um, ace of cups. Ace of Wands. Yeah, Ace of Wands. So there was quite a strong indication, I think, from the reading, even in, in, in Pelexven's interpretation, that Yeats's love interests and uh, unwillingness to remove himself from mundane financial life, including order polity, most likely, I would say, uh, would, though ultimately lead to fruition would require a rebalancing and a, a, a you know a tempering of the materialistic focuses of and his uh, his inability to let go of love represented by the five of cups and uh, let go of loss uh, or in a spiritual sense to um, oh, I, I found a, a good insight on that but I can't remember right now anyway a far more commanding mage figure than Yeats was required to organize and sustain such a group. <clears throat> After the departure of Mathers to Paris, even the Golden Dawn, which by 1892 had been a well-organized and operating unit for four years, failed to maintain a co the cohesion which Yeats felt was essential for a viable occult body. If an order like the Golden Dawn, which as, was, as Gerald York observed, the crowning glory of the occult revival in the 19th century, could not survive, how then could Yeats' Celtic mysteries? And that is a very excellent question that he was validly concerned about. It, uh, essentially, at one point, Yeats thought the Celtic mysteries, along with Mathers and Moyne, they were, they were thinking of making all the initiations of the Golden Dawn Celtic, rather than using Egyptian mythology. But then they decided to make a separate Celtic order that was an outer outer order or a, a corollary order to the Golden Dawn. Similar, very, very similar in how Dion Fortune later came along and created the Society of Inner Light as an uh, outer, outer layer, a, a, a tertiary outer order to the inner order and uh, trying to draw people in through even more diluted teachings. Of course, that became something else in itself entirely, uh, rising with Fortune, Dion Fortune's fame. Fortune's fame. The Golden Dawn was based on hundreds of years of arcane tradition. Its rituals, in which could be found something for nearly every taste, were monuments of occult eclecticism. The Celtic mysteries, by contrast, were based on the Golden Dawn at one remove and on Celtic mythology, itself a narrow, if spiritually rich, mixture of scholarship and vision. Furthermore, Yeats and his collaborators lacked Mather's skill in writing initiatory rites. As a comparison of the Celtic mysteries initiations of the spirit and Mather's portal and Adeptus Minor rites quickly shows. Yeats was, after all, a poet, not a priest, although he liked to think the two synonymous. Well, I believe Yeats did help compose the six equals five and seven four initiations and also rewrote all the 
outer initiations and added a lot of the poetry that exists in the Stella Matutina scripts found in Regardi's publications. So I'm not so sure if Yeats wasn't good at writing initiations. That might just be he felt he wasn't good at writing them. Uh, or I don't know. It's an interesting point that deserves a lot more uh, scrutiny. It's so easy to gloss over these these uh, statements, these exegesis of 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 the facts that we know, and we think, oh well, he couldn't have been that good at it. it love, it's very easy to write off Yeats' skill um, in a lot of areas. Just like it's easy to write off all these characters for their weaknesses, which we know much more about than their strengths. Most people don't usually write letters praising all of someone's strengths. Usually, they write letters complaining to others about some other person's crappy weaknesses and failings and flaws so that's what we got <clears throat> thus the most important and result <laughs> thus the most important end result of the celtic mysteries was not their insignificant contribution to the occult revival of the turn of the century but their very considerable impact on yeats's life and work that's probably true occult Celticism was so important to yeats in fact that he made it the focus of his only attempt at novel writing that's the speckled bird, yeah. Like the mysteries themselves, the speckled bird was never finished, but Yeats was reluctant to abandon it. It contained much of himself. There currently is a critical edition of it's a couple hundred, few hundred dollars, uh, that has all three versions with notes, uh, yeah, by a you know, scholar or several. Uh, I wish I had it. As William H. O'Donnell noted in the preface to his edition of the novel, some of the events and characters are strongly reminiscent both of the author's unsuccessful labors on the Castle of Heroes and of the Golden Dawn's revolt in 1900 against MacGregor Mathers. The novel repays a close look for what it reveals on Yeats's attitude towards the mysteries and the events of his life which surrounded them. The hero of the novel, Michael Hearn, who is clearly a heightened self-portrait of the author, plans with Samuel McLaughlin, McLaughlin, <laughs> who is obviously patterned closely on Mathers, to create an order which will establish a new kind of worship in which the calling up of the spirits of water and fire and air will be very important. McLaughlin seeks to create a new Eleusis, but Hearn, influenced by a number of visions reminiscent of some of those experienced in the Celtic explorations of 1898 18, to 1899, insisted that it be not founded on Egypt or Greece, for they must make the land in which they lived, i.e. Ireland, a holy land. 